Recording by John Talcott. Topsy Turvy by Jules Verne. Translated by Anonymous. Chapter 13. At the close of which, J.T. Maston utters an epigram. Time went on, however, and very likely also the works of Barbara Cohn and Captain Nichol, who were going on also under these very surprising conditions, no one knew where. How is it possible, he was asked, that an operation which required the establishment of a considerable iron foundry, the erection of high blast furnaces, capable of melting a mass of metal a million times as large as the Marine Corps cannon, of 27 centimeters, and a projectile weighing 180,000 tons, all of which necessitated the employment of several thousand workmen, their transport, their management, etc. Yes, how was it possible that such an operation could go on without the interested world getting any knowledge of it? In which part of the old or new world had Barbicane and company secretly established a foothold so that no hint was given to people living in the vicinity. Was it on a deserted island in the Pacific Ocean, or in the Indian Ocean? But there were no more deserted islands. The English had gobbled them all up. Perhaps the new society had discovered one for this special purpose. Perhaps, one remarked, there might be in some part of the Arctic regions. No, this could not be as it was simply because they could not be reached that the NPPA was going to remove them. Therefore, to look for President Barbicane and Captain Nichol on one of these islands or in some inaccessible point was simply wasting time. Did not the notebook taken away from J.T. Maston state that the shooting would take place on or about the equator? And all the countries around it were inhabited by some people. It seemed impossible for them to be so secreted in any part of the habitable world without someone informing the committee at Baltimore. Now, what did Alcide Perdue think of all of this? He was dreaming of all kinds of consequences which this operation would have. That Captain Nichol had invented an explosive of such tremendous power that he had found the melimelonite with a explosive force three or four thousand times stronger than that of the most violent explosion known, and five thousand six hundred times stronger than the good old black powder of our ancestors, this was astonishing enough, very astonishing. But it was not impossible at all. One can hardly know what the future will bring in these days of progress when devices exist to destroy whole armies at very long distances. In any event, the change of the Earth's axis produced by the recoil of a piece of ordnance was not sufficiently novel to astonish the French engineer. Then, considering the plans of President Barbicane, he said, It is evident that the Earth receives daily the recoil of all the blows which are given on its surface. Hundreds of thousands of people amuse themselves daily by sending thousands of projectiles weighing a few kilograms or millions of projectiles weighing a few grams. And even when I walk or jump or when I stretch out my arm, all this takes place on the surface of our sphere and adds to or checks its motion. Is, then, your great machine of such a nature as to produce the recoil asked for? How in the name of candor can this recoil be sufficient to move the earth? And if the calculations of this fellow, J.T. Maston, prove it, it is easy enough to show it. Alcide Perdue could not but admire the ingenious calculations of the secretary of the gun club which were communicated by the members of the inquiry committee to those wise people who were able to understand them. And Alcide Perdue, who was able to read algebra like one would read a newspaper, 
found in this sort of reading matter an inexpressible charm. If these changes were to take place, what a terrible catastrophe it would be. Towns would be turned upside down. Oceans would be thrown out of their beds. People killed by millions. It would be an earthquake of incomparable violence. If, perhaps, said Alcide Perdue, this damnable powder of Captain Nichelle were less strong, we might hope that the projectile would again strike the earth after the shooting. And after having made the trip around the globe, then everything would be replaced in a very short time and without having caused any very great destruction. But do not worry about that. Thanks to their melimelonite, the bullet will go its way and not return to the earth to beg her pardon for having deranged her by putting her back again in her place. Perdue finally said, If the place of shooting were known, I would say soon be able to say upon which places the movement would have the least and where the greatest effect. The people might be informed in time to save themselves before their cities and houses had fallen under the blow. But how are we to know it? I think, he said, the consequences of the shock may be more complicated than can even be imagined. The volcanoes, profiting by this occasion, would vomit like a person who is seasick. Perhaps a part of the ocean might fall into one of their craters. It would make small difference then. It is entirely possible that we might have explosives which will make our earth jump. Ah, this Satan Maston. Imagine him juggling with our earthly globe and playing with it as if he were playing billiards. So talked and reasoned Alcide Perdue. Soon these terrible hypotheses were taken up and discussed by the newspapers. A confusion which would be the result of the scheme of Barbicane and company could only result in terrible accidents. And so it happened that the nearer the day came, the greater the fright which took possession of the bravest people. It was the same as it was in the year 1000, when all living people supposed that they would be thrown suddenly into the jaws of death. It may be recalled what happened at this period. According to the Apocalypse, the people were led to believe that the Judgment Day had come. In the last year of the 10th century, says H. Martin, everything was interrupted. Pleasures, business, interest, all, even the public works of the country. Thinking only of the eternity which was to begin on the morrow, provisions was made only for the most necessary articles from one or two days. All possessions, real estate, castles, were bequeathed to the church so as to acquire protection in that kingdom of heaven where all were so soon to enter. Many donations to the church were made with these words, As the end of the world has come, and its ruin is imminent. When this fatal time came, all the people ran to the churches and places set apart for religious meetings, and waited to hear the seven trumpets of the seven angels of the judgment day sound, and call from heaven. We know that the first day of 1000 came and went, and nothing was changed. But this time, it was not the question of disturbance simply based upon some verse of the Bible. It was the question of removing the axis of the earth, and this was founded on very reliable calculations, and was very probable. Under these conditions, the situation of J.T. Mastin became each day more and more critical. Mrs. Angelina Scorbitt trembled lest he would become the victim of a universal cry for vengeance. Perhaps she even had in her mind the idea of making him give up the information which he so heroically held to himself. But she did not dare to mention it to him, and she did well. It would have been unwise for her to expose herself to the volley of rebukes he would have given her. As we may well understand, fright had taken a strong foothold in the city of Baltimore. 
and the inhabitants became nearly unmanageable. The excitement was increased by articles appearing in the daily papers. In any case, if J.T. Maston had been found among the crowd of people, his fate would have been soon settled. He would have been given to the wild beast. But he was content and said, I am ready for it. No matter what happened, J.T. Maston refused to make known the situation of the X, knowing very well that if he should unveil the secret, President Barbicane and Captain Nichol would be unable to finish their work. It was an interesting struggle, this fight of one man against the whole world. It only made J.T. Maston a grander and better man in the eyes of Evangelina Scorbitt, and also in the opinion of his associates of the gun club. The secretary of the gun club became such a celebrated person that he began to receive letters, as all criminals do, from people who wished to have a few lines from the hand which was going to turn the world over. But even if this was all very nice, it became every day more and more dangerous for our secretary. The population hung day and night around the prison, with great noise and great tumult. The enraged crowd wanted to lynch J.T. Master. The police saw the moment would come when they would be unable to defend the prison and the prisoner J.T. Maston. Being desirous of giving satisfaction and information to the American people, as well as to the people of other countries, the government at Washington decided to put J.T. Maston before a court of justice. What other people have not been able to accomplish the judges will not, said Alcide Perdue who had, after all, a kind of friendly feeling for the unhappy calculator. On the morning of the 5th, September, the president of the commission went personally to the cell of the prisoner. Mrs. Evangelina Scorbin, at her own request, had been allowed to accompany him. Perhaps at this last attempt, the influence of this excellent lady would succeed and bring the hoped-for result. There was nothing to be left undone. All means possible were to be used to make this last attempt successful. If it was not, well, we will see. Yes, we will see. What we would see is the hanging of this brute Maston, said the people, and the event would have come off in all its horror if the people could have it their way. So it happened that at eleven o'clock J.T. Maston was ushered into the presence of Mrs. Evangelina Scorbitt, and John Prestons, President of the Inquiry Committee. The opening was a very simple one. The conversation consisted of the following questions and answers, very rapid on one side and very quiet on the other. And even under these circumstances, the calm, quiet speaker was J.T. Maston. For the last time, will you answer? asked John Prestons. Answer what? ironically observed the secretary of the gun club. Answer the question. Where is the place in which your associate, Barbicane, is at present? I have told it to you a hundred times. Repeat it for the one hundred and first time. He is where the shooting will take place. Where will the shooting take place? Where my associate, Barbicane, is. Have a care, J.T. Maston. For what? For the consequences of your refusal to answer, the result of which will be to prevent you from learning that which you should not know. But we have the right to know. That is not my opinion. We will bring you before the court. Go ahead. And the jury will condemn you. What care I? And as soon as judgment is rendered, it will be executed. All right. Dear Maston, ventured Mrs. Evangelina Scorbitt, whose heart nearly broke on account of these terrible threats. What? You, madam? said J.T. Maston. 
She hung her head and was silent. And do you want to know what this judgment will be? If you wish to tell it, said J.T. Maston, that you will suffer capital punishment as you deserve. Really? That you will be hanged as sure, sir, as two and two makes four. Then, sir, I have yet a chance, said J.T. Maston reflectingly. If you were a little better mathematician, you would not say that two and two are four. You simply prove that all mathematicians have been fools until today in affirming that the sum of two numbers is equal to one of their parts. That is, two and two are exactly four. Sir, cried the president, absolutely puzzled. Well, said J.T. Maston, if you were, if you would say, as sure as one and one are two, all right. That is absolutely evident, because that is no longer a theorem. This is a definition. After this lesson in simple arithmetic, the president of the committee went out, followed by Mrs. Evangelina Scorbitt, who had so much admiration for the calculator that she did not venture to look at him. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 very short, but in which X takes a geographical value. Very luckily for J.T. Maston, the federal government received the following telegram sent by the American consul stationed at Zanzibar. To John S. Wright, Minister of State, Washington, USA. Zanzibar, September 13, 5 a.m. local time. Great works are being executed in the Wamasai, south of the chain of Kilimanjaro. For eight months, President Barbicone and Captain Nichol have been established there with a great number of black help under the authority of Sultan Bali Bali. This is brought to the knowledge of the government by its devoted Richard W. Trust, Consul. And this was how the secret of J.T. Maston became known. And therefore, were the secretary of the gun club still in prison, he could not have been hanged. But, after all, who knows whether he would not rather have been glad to meet with death in the full glory of his life than to live on with all the chances of disappointment. End of chapter 14 Recording by John Talcott